Well, my name is Richard Salvi. I'm at the University of Buffalo, and I do a lot of work on noise-induced hearing loss, tinnitus, and a lot of the work I'm doing right now is focusing on hyperacusis, which is a loudness tolerance problem where moderate sounds that for everybody else would be extremely loud for an individual with hyperacusis. There was an interesting uh, report reviewed done by uh, Richard Tyler and uh, his fellow Pienkowski on uh, different types of hyperacusis. One type is called loudness hyperacusis, where just everything sounds too loud for you. Uh, there are other types of hyperacusis. One was called avoidance hyperacusis. When you're around the loud sounds, you have to escape. You either put earmuffs on or earplugs or you just get out of the scene. Uh, there's another version of that, probably similar in nature, but it's called fear hyperacusis, where not only do you go away, but you're very fearful of loud sounds. You try to never expose yourself. Uh, these people don't go to loud music concerts. And the last one is pretty unusual. It's called pain hyperacusis, where you listen to loud sounds and you'll feel pain around your ear and sometimes in your ear canal. Well, we really don't know the underlying mechanisms. Uh, surely for pain hyperacusis, that's quite a bit different and might involve pain centers either in the ear or the brain. Loudness hyperacusis, uh, we think we have some insights about what may be causing that. One thought is your brain just becomes hyperactive. When a normal person listens to a sound, there's a moderate amount of brain activity. When somebody has loudness hyperacusis, when the sound comes in, it really jazzes up brain activity. It just gets too loud. And then the avoidance hyperacusis and fear hyperacusis, they may activate different parts of the brain. They, part of the brain that's thought to be involved with emotion is the amygdala. So when you hear a, somebody scratching on a chalkboard or a baby crying, not only is it loud, but it actually sort of evokes a strong emotional component. So we think there are some uh, neurological substrates for these different types of hyperacusis. The pain hyperacusis, there's a couple of different theories. One theory is that there's a group of neurons in your inner, inner ear called type 2 neurons, and they seem to get triggered by the release of uh, damaged cells. Those materials are secreted, basically activate the neurons and trigger them to send a pain message into the brain. There's another theory that involves the trigeminal nerve. The trigeminal nerve is a nerve that provides sensory input from around the face and on the eardrum. Loud sound comes in and might damage the eardrum. That could evoke pain. And there's other theories that involve things like opioid receptors, pain receptors that are in the brain. So our current interests, our research interests have uh, basically come about from work on uh, a phenomena called central gain. When you develop a hearing loss, what happens, your brain seems to try to compensate for this by turning up the neural activity. So you have a weak signal coming into your brain because your ear is damaged and the brain seems to jack up its neural activity. Uh, so we've been interested in uh, what could be the perceptual correlates of this. We've been looking at hyperacusis. So we have a couple of different animal models for looking at uh, hyperacusis. One of them is loudness recruitment. One, one of the ways we do this is we train animals to make a response. They basically uh, uh, press a bar when they are waiting to hear for a sound. When the sound comes, they release the bar and they'll get a food pellet. And the louder the sound is, the faster they respond. So you can use this thing called reaction time. I always uh, analogize to this, when my wife yells at me, I react very quickly. When she speaks quietly, I might not react at all. So you can use this behavioral response to measure loudness. We've been looking at drugs that induce uh, hyperacusis. One of the drugs we use is a really high dose of aspirin. It's got an active ingredient called salicylic. When we give the animals these high drug doses, you'll see their reaction times become much faster than normal. So we think they have hyperacusis. Same thing happens when we do a noise exposure. People that get noise exposed also experience hyperacusis. We have another animal model I think is quite interesting. It doesn't involve any training. Uh, rodents like mice and rats 
really don't like to be in bright open spaces like I am right now uh, for this interview. Uh, so we have a compartment where there's a dark box and a bright open space. We put the animals in there and the rats or mice will go and hide out in the dark box. We can test their aversion to loud sounds by putting in the dark box, we put a speaker in there, we turn the volume up. As we turn the volume up of the sound, the animals leave the dark box and they go into the open space. So without any training, we can see what sounds are aversive to them. And we find when we give these animals a hearing loss, like from a loud noise exposure, that the animals will develop, they'll leave the dark box sooner than they normally would. Sounds that normally would not be very aversive to them will drive them out of the dark box. So it's, we have two really very good behavioral models of how to measure hyperacusis, and we try to couple them with our electrophysiological measurements from the brain. We look at the brain activity and see whether it's been super hyperactive after these conditions. We think these animal models would be really good for understanding the basic biological mechanisms of hyperacusis. That's number one. Number two, because we think we have very solid animal models that could be used to use uh, drug screens. You could give an animal that's developed hyperacusis a drug to see if it would suppress the hyperacusis-like phenomena. So we think that has a really a lot of potential for developing therapies for hyperacusis other than things like sound therapies. My views on hearing regeneration are developed from some work that I've done many, many years ago in, in animal models like birds that can regenerate their hair cells. But in mammals, uh, there are uh, techniques going on to uh, try to regenerate hair cells in the uh, inner ear of uh, both animals and humans. Uh, most of the techniques involve trying to either inject viruses that carry a gene into the inner ear to convert the support cells into neurons. And also there's some other drug therapies that are being used. The same general idea that they will convert some of the supporting cells into sensory hair cells that will allow us to hear again. Uh, there's two clinical trials that are going on right now. I think one is going on in the US and one is going on in Europe. We don't have any of the results from them. I think uh, there's a lot of hope that these will work but it's probably going to be extremely complicated in quite a few years before we get it all worked out.